one of the dudes tries to stab me. And for real, bro, and I'm not making this shit up, I hit the kid and drop him. Thank God. He could have stabbed me, but he hesitated. And what happened to him? He dies. And that's why I call my book Blood on the Razor Wire. Many people have left their blood on the razor wire in federal prison. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to The Connect. I'm Johnny Mitchell. As usual, make sure to like and subscribe, turn on notifications, follow me on Instagram, at Mr. Johnny Mitchell. You guys, let's get those Instagram numbers up. Follow me on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Connect Show for all types of crazy bonus content that we can't show you on YouTube. And we're gonna get into it. You guys, this is an interview today with Chad Marks. He is an ex-drug dealer and gangbanger out of Rochester, New York. He spent 17 years in federal prison. He became a jailhouse lawyer, and he is out now, and he's working on uh, appeals for a lot of other federal inmates. He has some wild stories. This was an amazing episode, so enjoy it. What's up, guys? Let's take a minute to thank our amazing new sponsor, Mood, an online cannabis company that ships THC products to anywhere in the U.S., legally. You heard that right. Mood deals in Delta 8 and Delta 9 THC products, okay? And if you don't know, Delta 8 and Delta 9 are compounds, THC compounds found in actual bud, actual marijuana. But when they're broken down and put into things like vapes, flowers, pre-rolls, different kind of concentrates, gummies, you can ship them anywhere legally and they still get you fucked up. So if you live in a state where pot is still illegal, you can get Mood to send you all of these different THC products. Right now, Mood is offering our viewers free gummies. That's right, you guys. Click the link in the description, grab any pack of five count gummies and add code CONNECTFREE at checkout. That's CONNECTFREE. All you have to do is pay for shipping. But that's not all they're offering. On top of the free pack of gummies, you can use promo code CONNECT20. That's C O N N E C T 20 in combination with the gummy code and get 20% off your first order. You guys, these are an amazing product. They're exactly what we are trying to sell and promote here on The Connect. They are fucking the federal government. This is an amazing loophole, and they're just amazing products. Head over to hellomood.co and support them because they support the show. All right, let's get back into it. All right, Chad Marks, what's up, brother? What's going on, man? How are you? Dude, I'm stoked, and I apologize again for the uh, you know the technical issues, but it's wild to have you as the first episode of the Connect podcast. Uh, how did you did you find me, or did I find you? I reached out to you. I seen your YouTube channel was blowing up, and I'm like, yeah. hey, I need to reach out to this dude and see if he'll come on my channel. For <laughs> I think I will after this episode, man. That's I get a lot. Of, I get a lot of people reaching out to me. Um, most don't have the charisma or the story, but uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a fascinating one. So we'll just get into it. So you're from Rochester? Rochester, New York. All right. Uh, and just let's, let's start from the beginning. How old are you? How did you come up? How did you get your start in the game? And, uh, and how did you fall? I guess we'll start with that. Okay, so um, I'm 44 years old, man. At the age of 24, I was arrested by the feds. Ended up in federal court. Eventually, I went to trial on a conspiracy case for crack cocaine. Um, two 924C counts. A lot of people don't know what that is, but that's possessing guns and furtherance of a drug trafficking crime. They give you five for the first one, 25 for the second. Eventually, I go to trial. I blow trial. I lose. And I'm sentenced to 40 years. But how did all that start? Mm -hmm. So I grew up kind of poor. My father was a drug addict. He left the house when I was three. Um, my mother was pretty much a single mother. So everything was a struggle, man. I grew up in the hood. I grew up in the ghetto. And by the time I was 12, 13 years old, I'm like, man, I don't want to live like this. One of my friends was out there hustling, petty hustler. And he's like, look, man, you come over here, sell bags with us, do whatever. And that's kind of where it started. He tried to like play us. But I always had that mind, man, where I'm an entrepreneur, even as a young kid. Are we talking so about said, you know selling what? pot at 13 or 12 or 13? Or are we already up to selling krills, crack? We're selling cocaine at the time, right? This is probably 1993. Powder. That was when Biggie selling, Smalls was the man. You're selling powder. You know, we're watching Biggie. Go ahead. You're selling powder. We're selling powder. Wow. Okay. And how how does a 12 or 13 year old white kid, right, Irish kid, in Rochester, uh, you grew up in a black ghetto, I assume. How? Well, how, yeah. How do much. you? How does one just? at 12 years old, start selling powder cocaine. You know what I mean? Are you on a corner? 
Like, how are you how are you distributing it at that age? Okay, so I'm going to tell you. This is what it is, right? I got a friend. He's my age. His name's Booper. His mother's a prostitute. His uncle's a drug addict and, and a pimp. And they got a, pretty much, they got a crack house where it would be called a smokehouse back then. They're selling out of there. People are getting high over there. And it starts getting a little bit hot. So his uncle's like, look, man, I'm going to have you start selling bags next door. You're going to pay these people $40 a day and you're going to sell cocaine out of there. So he's selling cocaine out of there. He acts like he's a little more older than us, but really we're the same age. And I'm broke. So I'm like, yo, bro, I want to start, you know, helping out. What's up? And he's like, ah, man, trying to play us. You know, like he's that dude. And really he's not. So that's how it starts out where I'm just sitting in a spot with him and they might give you $500 worth of powder cocaine. You sell it and you make $70. That's yeah. what we were getting back then. Yeah. So we make $70 profit. That's how it started. Yeah. And I started thinking within a month, man, I'm not going to be living like this, man. I'm not going to be working for these people at 12, 13 years old, making 70 bucks. So I started saving my little bit of money. I knew who their connect was. I'm like, hey, what's up? It was a dude named Bouncy. So I'm like, hey, what's up, Bouncy? Man, I'm trying to get eight ball. You know, I know the lingo. I know the terms. And that's how it started. An eight ball turned into a quarter ounce. A quarter ounce turned into a half ounce. And then it took off from there. Mm -hmm. Back then, we would buy 62s, two ounces, six grams. And then from there, it goes to a big eight, which is double that. And that's just kind of where it started. But eventually, at the age of 16, I'm arrested and I end up going to state prison. I do a two to six, come home, and now the world has changed. Now it's no longer powder cocaine. Everybody's smoking crack. So I get a little job and I get out of prison. That doesn't work out. I'm working there for like a month and a half. And I'm like, you know what? I'm jumping back in the game. And that's what happened, man. I jumped back in the game, started coming up. My best friend was Mexican and Irish. And uh, he had some family down there in Texas. So we started going down to Texas and doing some things there. Went to New York, did some things there and uh, started bringing stuff back and kind of blew up. I guess you could say to a certain extent. And eventually, man, I'm arrested by the federal government. And was that a crack charge? So when they first arrested me, what they do is they charge us for crack cocaine, right? They charge us in a conspiracy for 50 grams or more crack cocaine, one count. But when they do the drug bust and they and they bust all the houses, they find three kilos, $219,000 cash, and a couple weapons. They don't charge us with that yet. In federal court, they just charge us with that one count. Mm -hmm. So the one count, I'm facing 10 to life. We start arguing back and forth, 10, 11 months, the case is going on. And they say, look, we're going to offer you a plea agreement. If you don't take the plea, we're going to supersede you. I'm like, okay, I don't take the plea agreement. Now the government supersedes me with all the other charges. Now it's 16 counts. The mandatory minimum goes from 10 to 40 years. The judge cannot give me any less than 40 if I go to trial and lose. I'm getting ready to go to trial. I say, hey, look, man, tell them I'll take 17 years. That's, that's the point that it got to. They said, no, 27. I said, man, I can't do 27 years. I've only been alive. I'm only 24 years old yeah. at the time of my arrest. I'm not going to do 27 years in federal prison. So they come back and say 25. I told them, man, let's roll the dice. We roll the dice. I go to trial. I get convicted. And the judge sentences me to the 40-year federal mandatory minimum, brother. Did you have a paid lawyer? Did you have a good lawyer? Or did you have a, a dump truck? Here's the best part. I had one of the best lawyers in my city. It cost me $40,000 for a lawyer, and I got 40 years. Isn't that kind of ironic? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that, you hate when that happens. You spend a bunch of money on a lawyer, and uh, you know you still get flushed down the toilet. So it happened to a lot of dudes. Um, did you feel like, were you advised to take the original plea agreement of 10 years? Well, really, the plea agreement back then, that was the mandatory minimum. The plea was 11 to 14. Right. I tell the lawyer, look, check this out, right? I'll take the 11 to 14. But see if you can get the two points off for the gun, because then if I go to federal prison without a gun enhancement, I could end up, you know, getting a year off. He's like, well, let me look into it. Let me see what's going on. He never looks into it. And the government just says, you know what? We're tired of it. And they bang me. But that's because he had a death penalty case that was going on. He was too busy with that case. And he wasn't concerned with my case. So that's what ends up happening. Yeah, and that's crazy. That, that is years. a very that is a very easy fuck up. But one that cost you, you know an extra decade of your life. Now, I wanna go back really quick to state prison. Where, when you originally got locked up, you were 16 years old. And what did they bust you with? So when I'm 16, I get busted selling bags out of a house. Mm -hmm. I have an assault second degree, that was pending. And then I get busted in a house. Well, we're probably doing about, we're probably selling about two ounces a night in dime bags, right? That's a lot they of hit the house That's a lot they, of transactions if, in dime bags, you know? Yeah, I mean, hey, I'm going to keep it real. Back then, I was a petty hustler. You know what I mean? Right, right. Um, I was just a young kid, man, copping 62s, bagging them up. Yeah. And 
selling bags. And were you, were there other white cocaine or crack dealers in your neighborhood? Or was it, you know, like, tell me, what did that look like? I mean, there were some, Portland, not many. We thought, we thought only black people sold crack, truly. Like, I've never met a white crack dealer. <laughs> well, this is the deal, right? I mean, when I, when, I, when I eventually was selling crack, back then it was powder cocaine when I got busted back right. then. Um, but when I started selling crack, I mean, my whole team was you know, pretty much all black dudes, right? I'm, I'm the head of the drug organization, you know, according to the government. Sure, um, sure. But all my workers were black dudes, kids that I grew up with, all my friends. Um, were there other white crack dealers in my neighborhood? There was one other dude that they called White Boy Rick, not the guy that they did the documentary on, right. but another dude, um, pretty well-known dude where I'm from. And me, like when you talk about white crack dealers in my city, it's either me or Rick. Right. I mean, now it's much different. I mean, there's white crack dealers, Spanish, black. Right. I mean, everybody's hustling. Right, right. So they took you down. They busted you on powder. You got a two to six. And you did uh, what prison? Where were you at in state prison? Okay, so my first prison, I end up going to um, Wyoming Correctional Facility. Get a little jammed up over there. My 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 best friend's my co-defendant, all right? So we're there. He ends up getting in a fight with this dude over a basketball magazine, and they jump us. I ended up getting stabbed in the face. They stabbed me in the face. They hit him four or five times. Um, that night, he ends up going to off one hospital. I go to a different hospital. I get stabbed a couple times in the back. And he goes to com he goes to he ends up getting transferred to Kasaki. That night, this is Christmas Eve, brother. Christmas Eve, 1996. I leave Wyoming Correctional Facility, which is in upstate New York, and they send me to Attica. Mm -hmm. I'm about I'm 17 now while I'm doing my time. I'm 17 years old walking into Attica State Prison. Right, right. Um, as soon as we get there, it's it's you know, it's brutal, man. You so want to know if I was scared up? or nervous? Is of it course. like California prisons, uh, where everybody immediately, you know, if you're on like a level four yard or even a level three, you immediately click up with your ethnic group um, and then basically put in work? Is it kind of like that there? It's not like there in state prison, but it's like that in federal prison. In state prison, it's more of wherever you're from. Like if you're from Rochester, it, it don't matter if you're Spanish, black, white, we're like a gang. Interesting. And honestly, we were more like the tougher gang. Out right. of New York, right? Buffalo had their gang, you know, the Bronx, but New York City, of course, they're tough. They come together. But Rochester was like a gang, and we were known for violence. Did, uh, I mean, without, you know, incriminating at all, did you, I mean, did you witness stabbings? Did you witness killings? Uh, was that sort of thing going on when you were at Attica? Well, when I was at Attica, man, I seen, I, I was actually there only probably about 90 days, and then he sent me over to Comstock. I seen these two dudes having a little knife fight over there on the weight pit. One of the dudes picked up a weight, hit the dude with the weight. I didn't have a lot of uh, experience at Attica with violence, but when I got to federal prison, I was in the most dangerous federal prison in the country, Big Sandy. I've seen people murdered in prison. That's really interesting because, you know, most people think of federal prison as actually being nicer and safer. You know, I was in a very violent state prison. I was in, you know, and I know that violence in California, state prisons is rampant, right? People are getting stabbed up every day, you know, because the feds have more money. You'd assume it's a bigger, people are there longer. Uh, supposedly it's supposed to be nicer. So, but I guess not. I guess it just depends where you're at, right? Because you could go to some of these federal prisons for white collar criminals that are, they're hitting golf balls and eating haagen ice cream, you know? Well, well, let me, let me correct that a little bit for the people, right? Um, state prison in New York, couldn't hold a match to federal prison. All the federal prisons, pretty much unless you're at a camp or a low, are dangerous places. Um, violence is at an all-time high. I was actually in prison with that dude Stanford, right? White-collar criminal, stole all that money, had the banks all over the country. Um, I was with him, dude. They brutalized him in a county jail. They were extorting him in USP Coleman. It's definitely not a place that anybody wants to go. They're not playing tennis in there. They're not eating steaks. Right. You're not having a great time. Right. It is right. viciously violent. Now, um, why, why example, is that, do you think? Why do you think federal prisons are more violent than state prisons on the whole? Okay, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you why. This is why they're more dangerous than state prisons. You know, back in the day, they would bring in all them rich people and, you know, people that were like had class. But when they started cracking down, they started bringing in crack dealers, gun toters, bank robbers. Um, Washington, D.C. doesn't have a prison system. Right. So they all go to federal prison. Right. And people are, you know, people are poor. People are hungry, man. People are trying to hustle. People are trying to steal. People are trying to extort. Um, I had a cellmate from New York, had 25 years, Adam Oliveri, mob guy. He stabs the cop. 
The cop takes a gallon of wine. He says, hey, man, I'm about to stab this dude. And I talk about that in my book. And I'm like, yeah, right. He's like, no, I'm about to go stab him. And he went down there and stabbed the cop. My first, you know, my one of my first things at Big Sandy, which was the most dangerous federal prison at the time in the system, these guys, there's a black dude and a Mexican, and they tag up on this other Mexican from Texas, right? You're like, what? Because usually it's not like that. Right. They're beating this dude with a lock. And the cops shoot the guy that's getting beat with the law. They shot oh. the wrong guy. Wow. They that shot happens. him on accident. And they kill him? Um, Did they kill him? Go ahead. Did they kill him? No, they didn't kill him. But at Big Sandy, I had got involved in something, man, with a dude named Ace that was from, he was from Ohio. He had like 300 years, bank robber. Um, I get in an incident with him. They jump me a little bit because I'm telling him, like, hey, I'm not going to be a part of the car. You know, he's like, look. Our shot caller is the dude from the movie The Town with Stevie Burke. Stevie Burke goes to the hole. Things get out of control over there. You know, people are kind of like looking up to me a little bit as a leader. They're looking up to him as a leader. And it was kind of like a power struggle that I didn't want to be involved in. So anyway, we end up getting into it. I fight four or five of them dudes out there on the compound. He tries, one of the dudes tries to stab me. And for real, bro, and I'm not making this shit up, I hit the kid and drop him. Thank God. He could have stabbed me, but he hesitated. I don't think he really wanted to stab me, man. I think he was faking for the car. Yeah. I hit him. The knife drops. I could shoot you over the shot. I probably got the shot in here somewhere. Um, And his other boy throws the knife down, down the drain because all the cops are coming. Well, a year later to the day, that same dude, Ace, he's out there on the yard. They're jumping him now. They're stabbing him. He pulls out a knife. He starts stabbing one of the other dudes, and they shoot him from the gun tower with an AR-15. They shoot him through the back, blow his guts out of his stomach, bro. Yeah. And the nurse is there trying to push his guts back into his stomach and wipe the dirt off. And what happened to him? He dies. And that's why I call my book Blood on the Razor Wire. Many people have left their blood on the razor wire in federal prison. Wow. Yeah. And they said in the feds, uh, when the riot kicks off, you, they give you one warning shot, pow, and then everybody's got to hit the dirt and the next one could kill you. Well, I mean, I think it's a little bit more than that. They might fire two or three warning shots. They got this thing that comes on about getting on the ground and they say it in Spanish. Quest the same on Tuso or some shit like that. And if you don't get down, they will definitely shoot you. They have no problem shooting. Yeah, yeah. I've heard, uh, you know, sometimes it, COs, I heard this from an OG. He said that the COs, if they have a beef with each other, they'll actually use a prison riot as an opportunity to, like, shoot another CO. I thought that was kind of wild. You know what I mean? Like, like if a CO was, like, breaking up. This was at, you know... This is back in the 80s in like Folsom, right? These ultra violent, you know, mayhem style riots that would kick off. Uh, you know, this old head I knew, Rodney, he said one of the COs was trying to break up uh, a fight that was turning into a riot on the yard, and the other CO shot the CO. <laughs> and there was rumors I mean, I've that never the guy was. I've never experienced that, but. Um, what did. Uh, so you got out of state prison. You parole, you did, you, they maxed you out. Did you do your full six or did you get, did you get paroled? Did you get out early? So this is what happens. I do two years. I make my first parole board. I get out. I'm out for a little while, catch a violation. I go back. I do another two years, get out. I'm home 14 months. I'm only home 14 months. And that's when I catch the federal case. Wow. That's how quickly it happens. And what were you, did you have a family at this time or what was going on in your personal life? So my personal life was, um, I had a girlfriend, I ended up getting married to her. Um, and eventually, man, I go to prison. We didn't have any children, any of that stuff. I go off the federal prison to start talking to, you know, big numbers and pretty much tell her she has to go on with her life, go on with your life, live your best life. I'm going to prison for the rest of mine. And eventually, you know, part of my story is I do get out. We reconnect, we get remarried and we got two 10 and a half month old boys right now. Amazing. Now, when you got hit with 40 years, did you assume you were done? Like, what was your mindset at the time? I mean, when I get hit with the 40 years, and this is in the prologue of the book too, you might want to check it out. Um, when he sentences me to 40 years, man, you're broken. You're, you're like, wow. You start thinking like, damn, my life's over with, right? And then you start thinking, man, I got to start doing my own legal work. I got to do something because no one's going to fight for my life like I am. Right. And eventually that's what I did. I spent a lot of my time in the law library. Right. I learned the law. Um, many people refer to me as the lawyer or, you know, I was one of the best jailhouse lawyers in the whole federal system. I actually wrote the compassionate release, um, motion that everybody's winning on. I wrote the first one, wrote wow. it for a guy out of Texas named Conrado Cantu. 
So, you know, thousands and thousands of people are getting out on that now. That's unbelievable. Now, how many, were you just at Big Sandy or what was the journey like? Start from the beginning of your stretch, your federal stretch. Okay, so I've been to a couple federal prisons, right? You could be in a place four or five years and they'll pack you up, move you, you get jammed up, you do something, you commit an assault, they'll pack you up, transfer you. Um, if you get assaulted, they'll transfer you. So I started out in Big Sandy. Um, eventually, I end up leaving Big Sandy. I get in that little incident with Ace in the Ohio right. East Coast car. And when right. I say a car, that's what it is over there. They call that's them right. cars, but really they're right. gangs. And what was um, Big Sandy like in terms of, you said that was pretty violent. Um, just go into that. Like, what do you recall? Was it was it over, was it just gang banging? Was it over drugs? Was uh, Tell us about the drug traffic in prison and kind of go into that. Yeah, I mean, there's always problems over anything in federal prison. I used to say people make up reasons to stab people, right? Yeah. So, I mean, are there problems there all the time? I mean, there's stabbings all the time. You would know, you, it could just be, be a beef strapped? over a television. It could be a beef over, you know, a drug debt. It could be, I've seen a lot of issues when people get drunk. People right. get drunk in federal prison and get tough. Right. And then people end up dying. Did you uh, did you carry a shank, a shank around with you for protection? Every single day. Right, right, right. Did you, uh, and how about boots in the shower? Which I always think is funny, but, you know, I tell people when the riot was on, when the beef was on, even in state prison, we used to take our boots to the shower just in case something kicked off. So in Big Sandy, if you're white, right, everything's racially segregated in federal prison, probably much like the West Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're in the white car, I mean, that was mandatory. You're going to walk to the shower with your boots. You're going to have a dude with you at, you know, that's how it was back then. You got a dude with you. He's standing point. All the showers have gates on them. So you open the gate, you go in the shower with your boots, put on your shower shoes, jump in the shower. The dude's standing out in front. He's probably got a knife on him. I always kept my knife with me in the shower, outside of the shower. Um, and, you know, you come out, you walk back to your cell. He stands point while you're out there changing. And then he might go to the shower, and now you're the point man. So everything's racially segregated, and everybody has to be, you know, and, and not on no racial shit, bro, but that's just what it is. That's yeah. how it is. Now, what if what if you, so everybody's strapped. Let's just, just assume everybody's strapped, or they're, the bodyguard they got with them is strapped with a shank. Uh, the guards must know this. Of course they know, but they're scared. I mean, I was in Big Sandy, and almost every cop that worked there was pretty much just, you know, hoping they get out of there in eight hours. And, you know, that might sound far-fetched to people, but that's really the life that we live inside a maximum security federal prison. So there really was, uh, you know, I, I had a buddy who was in the feds. He said they're starting to put, uh, what do you what you call it, um, metal detectors I I around certain areas of the prison. Um, but I, I, so it's essentially there's very little regulation when it comes to carrying your shank around. Like there's really not going to be guards stopping you everywhere you go patting you down. They can't. It's crazy you talk about that because in my book, in one of my chapters, I talk about how we're going to the yard. A dude goes over and unplugs the metal detector so we can all walk through with our knives because we had a little beef. We had something that was going on with a white supremacist gang that we were getting ready to get into it with. Right. And we were all suited and booted, ready to go. Um, the cops know that you got a knife. There's cops that'll pat you down and feel a knife just right. on camera and let you ride, bro. Right. They're not trying to take right. your knife. Right. Are there other cops there that will take your knife and lock you up? Of course. Right. But a lot of them are just trying to do their eight hours, man, and, and get out of there and get out of there alive. Were you, uh, at least at the beginning, were you involved in doing dirt, putting in work for your car or, or you know, your set for Rochester? So when I walk in there, right, um, the first thing you do is the white dudes approach you. Hey, where are you from? This is what it is. You got to have your paperwork. You get 30 days. How much time you got? But they already kind of know that you're coming. Yeah. And the cops will pull up your PSI for them right in the office. You want to see what it is? There it is. The case manager. People will just pull up your stuff, right? So as soon as they check you out, man, they give you a knife. And the first knife I got was a piece of plexiglass. And I'm like, man, I probably need a bone crusher in here. I need a piece of steel. Yeah. So eventually I ended up getting a piece of steel. Um, have I put in work? Of course. You have to put in work. If you don't put in work, your ass is out of there. You know, right. and, and they want you to, they want to see you do that. But I was from the East Coast, and, you know, my celly was Adam Oliveri. He was, like, the second in command of the car. The boss of the car was Stevie Burke, one of the dudes from Boston that the really the town. He's not now, one of them guys on, on Let me stop you there. Who was he in the town? Which character was he portrayed in in the town? I think Stevie Burke was the dude when they were in the flower shop. When, when, when they killed the dude in the flower shop. That was supposed to be him? 
I think that's Stevie Burke. Stevie Burke ended up with like four or five life sentences. Right? Gotcha. Gotcha. For bank robbery. For yeah, bank robberies, armed bank robberies. Right. Um, right. The you know the trucks and all of that stuff. Right. So anyway, right. he's the shot caller, bro. He's pulling the strings over there, you know. Right. And they're like, look, man, this is what has to happen. We had an incident on a baseball field, and this kid Luke, you know, we're playing baseball, and he invites, he gets mad about a play or something, he invites everybody to his to his midsection, and I'm like, man, what did you say? And we get in a little disagreement. He goes to say something, bro, and I crack him. If not, guess what? It's probably going to be a race ride in there because he just disrespected people. Right. Another time that I had put in work was one of our homeboys. He's drunk. He's out on the tier talking shit. He's using the N-word. And the blacks come to Stevie and they're like, look, this dude's got to go. If not, it's going to be a big situation. So that's what we do. We go in the cell. We get a dude to hold it down. I put on some gloves. I go in there. And I think I write about that in the book. And I blast him first. And we're in there. I mean, we demolish this dude, man. But and that's honestly, important man, because it stops it stops it from becoming a larger issue, right? 100%. I mean, something like that could become a race riot, so we're going to stop it. And it's not that we're white and we're going to go beat up our own people to please other people, but this is how the system works. I mean, he was out there disrespecting people. He was drunk. And sometimes I feel like when dudes get drunk, they say shit and they really know what they're saying, but they're going to try to blame it on being drunk. Like, oh, I didn't realize what I was doing. Right. He knew what he was doing. So we beat him up. He gets down to the bottom of the stairs all bloody and he looks up there and he's like look what you white bitches did to me and i'm like and i you know we used to joke around about it i mean to laugh about it now in hindsight but my boy kicks him in the ass and he starts running away and he runs to the cops they take him never see the dude again but yeah man we did we did some bad things and you know sometimes i regret some of the stuff that i did but you have to do what you have to do to survive in federal well prison. you can't imagine 40 years it's it's like you have to become an animal uh, in many ways so I, I can't even imagine, but, um, well, I can't imagine, you know, I've been locked up with dudes doing all day times five. Right. Uh, so it's pretty horrifying. Now when people would get shanked and killed, you know, it's, what was, were they usually caught? Were the perpetrators usually arrested and recharged? Can you actually get away with a prison stabbing? Like do you hit somebody with a blind spot or is it pretty much the people doing that kind of shit? already lifers that have nothing to lose. Well, I'll give you a couple examples, right? This is the deal. If you, back then when you stab people in federal prison, you might go to the hole for 30 days, right? The guy that gets stabbed, he disappears. He goes to the hole. They transfer him. Sometimes you sit in the hole for a year to get transferred in federal prison. So as long as you didn't kill a dude, they didn't really charge you. Then they came up with this thing called the SMU, the special management unit. So now when you start stabbing people and you start becoming a problem, what they do is they send you to the SMU. So you're stuck in a cell for two years. You mess around over there. You get sent back. Have I seen people murdered? When I was in USP Lee, I've seen people murdered. There was a dude that, and since you're from, you know, the West Coast, here's one. Dude's from California. They get in a little issue. They're like, yo, bro, you got to go up top. That means you have to go to PC, protective custody. They send dude up top. Dude's in the hole. And in federal prison, they don't give a shit if you live or die. They go down there and tell him, you got to go back out there. And he's like, man, I checked in. I can't go back out there. They said, you're going back out there. Hold on, hold and on. Back Who then, said that? The guards, the guards said you're going back out there? Yeah, the administration tells you, you got to go back to population, big dog. You're not going to protect the custody. You got to go. Why would they You've do that? You've been down here 30 days. We don't think you're in danger. Right. So we're sending you back out, but really you're in danger. Right. So they send this kid out, right? His name's Lair Dog. They call him Lair Dog. They send Lair Dog out, but Lair Dog makes a knife in the hole. He goes out there. His homeboys press him. And dude's got like 90 days left. He presses him and he tells him, hey, look. You're going, you're out of here. You can't stay here. He's like, man, I'm not going nowhere. I'm staying. Now his pride's on the line, right? The image you project is the image you have to protect. So he pulls out a knife. They start beefing. He stabs him. Dude jumps back, puts his hand up like, oh, you, oh, you stabbed me? And I think we're going to see a fight, right? 20 seconds, man. I seen that dude die, man. He falls, boom, on the ground. Yeah. Gone. Life's over. He had like 90 days left to go home. Right. That was one of that was something vicious that I had seen, you know, at Lewis P. Lee. Yeah. Um, yeah. I seen the Nortenos hit a bulldog, right? Fresno Bulldog. They hit him on Halloween. I'm out on the yard, early call. You know, most people aren't going outside. They're going to chow. I'm out there walking around. Just got some bad news from home. This is 2009, Halloween. Walking around the yard, and I see dude, and he's full of blood. I don't even really see the incident. I just see him full of blood. And he's like, man, help me, man, help me. And I'm like, Man, I can't, I can't help you, man. Just keep walking, man. Go, go to the cop. Tell him you got to go to medical. 
This yeah. kid lived in the cell next door to me, and they had hit him probably 20, 30 times, bro, hit him in the face. He ended up living, but that yeah. was another vicious incident. Yeah. We had a yeah. we had a kid named Mario. He's from Washington, D.C. Mario's playing cards. Everybody's drinking. Dude from Virginia starts getting mad. He's losing his money. He's drunk. He stands up and pulls his shirt up, you know, like dudes in the street. So I put that knife in you. Mario's from Washington, D.C. This kid's from Virginia. The D.C. car, they got the numbers. They're pretty tough dudes, and they handle their business. And they're the car that you really don't want to mess with because there's just so many of them, right? So dude's faking like he's got a knife. Mario really has a knife. He's running the poker table. He jumps up, and he starts stabbing the shit out of this dude. And the dude's like, please, man, don't kill me, man. Don't kill me. And Mario says, it's too late for that. And you could see the blood, bro. It was all black, right? You're looking at, like, black blood. Yeah. And I knew. I said, this dude's dead, man, and he died. And Mario eventually was sentenced, I believe, to life. It was a death penalty case. They were seeking the death penalty right. for him, but I think he ended up with life. Right. So that's usually what happens. If you kill somebody in prison, generally they're going to give you another life sentence if you didn't already have one. 100%. If you kill them, you're hit, man. You're, you're going to prison for the rest of your life. And what, uh, you mentioned your celly stabbed that CO in the neck. What ended up happening with that? Did the CO survive? And what do they do with your celly? My celly stabbed him like, I think, nine times. They end up taking him to trial. So he had, I believe he had 20 years in the state, 11 in the Fed. So he's got 31 years. He's going to see the light of day. Well, they end up giving him a cop out, I believe, for 25 years. Adam ends up with another 25 years in federal prison. So now he's never getting out. Yeah, so he's doing like 50, basically. He's done. Pretty yeah, much yeah. he's done, man. Yeah, I, I, that was, you know, I saw, that's why I asked you when you get 40. I mean, you know, in the state prison, even where I was at in Oregon, you know, if you had more than 15 years, your odds of coming home reduce by like a huge amount because, you know, you're going to overdose or you're going to get killed or you're going to have to put in work and you're going to catch a life sentence. So... Uh, yeah, it's a dubious thing for sure when you're in those high level security, uh, you know, high security prisons. Now, what I'm fascinated by is the corruption in federal prison. You know, uh, did you talk about that really quick, if you would um, talk about the guards? You know, they, I assume they were complicit in bringing a lot of the dope in, a lot of the cell phones in, uh, et cetera. Did you see stuff like that going on while you were down? Oh, 100%, man. I mean, it happens all the time. They just ended up giving the head cook, I think they gave him 18 years from Big Sandy. He was bringing in the pack, right? There was another dude from Detroit. I'm not going to say his name specifically, but he had the CO and the case manager under his wing. I mean, they're bringing in heroin. They're bringing in whatever you needed. Right. Um, that's why I first seen a cell phone back then. Yeah. And I was like, wow, man, you know, seeing these, you know, these new phones. And I'm like, you know, it was nice. It was nice to be able to see something like that. Right. But of right. course there's corruption. Not everybody, but there's always a few select people. You know, I had an incident where we had a dude where he was cool with my celly. He acted like, hey, you know, joking around with my celly. And this isn't a maximum security prison. And usually you don't do that in federal prison. But the cop was kind of all right. Started telling my celly his personal business. You know, he, he was going to school to be a probation officer or a parole officer. He couldn't pay his tuition. So honestly, I told my celly, well, man, shit, dude's sharing his personal information. See what's up. So he talked to him. And, you know, we ended up sending him some money. Yeah. And truth be told, the dude stole our money. Oh, he got wow. scared Ran and never sent the up. money back. And honestly, like, we threatened him. We did all kinds of shit. And eventually, I ended up in the hole after that and ended up getting transferred. Um, But we were present. He robbed me and he robbed the Dominican kid that was getting big money on the compound. I was just trying to get him to bring in tobacco. Yeah. I mean, there's big money in tobacco in federal prison, right? Big Sometimes money. more than you would think, you know, for other drugs like heroin and shit right. like that. That's because they outlawed cigarettes. Dumbest thing they could have done, and it's the same in the state prisons, they made tobacco illegal, and now they just got this whole new racket for us to enjoy, you know? Sure. Um, how much would you pay? How would you get the tobacco in? Would you have a guard bring it in? Well, that's what we were trying to do. We were right. trying to get that guard to bring it in, right? Right. Um, like one Class A cigarette, one Newport in prison back then was 30 bucks. You could sell one Newport for, for $30. One cigarette. Wild. Wild. And what's uh and what kind of drugs? What were you guys? What was your car specifically uh, moving? Heroin, meth. Okay, so me personally, I wasn't selling any heroin, right? But um, you know, the car would do that. Like Stevie Burke would try to get a couple grams, whatever, and do what they had to do. The main drug of choice now in federal prison is K two. They're spraying the shit on paper. They're sending it in on legal work. I mean, listen, 
The prison administration already knows this shit. We're not snitching on no one. Of course not. They know yeah. what's going yeah. on. They're stopping people from getting mail now. You know, people are getting it in on legal mail. So I've been in places where an eyelash, the size of one of your eyelashes, was five dollars. And right. it was rocking these dudes, man, for 20, 30 minutes. These dudes are, I've seen people on the ground, I've seen people vomiting, I've seen people run through the unit screaming, ah, going right. crazy, right? So you get a imagine getting a sheet of this, right, from the street, and you're paying two grand in the street. What are you making in prison? You could be making fifteen, twenty thousand dollars off a sheet of paper, man. Right. And right. you know, there were some allegations that it was bug spray that they were actually putting raid on there, mixing it with some other shit. And that's what these people were make were, were smoking. Wow. And you know, to see that, I was just like, I, that was the new crack. That was the prison crack. Man. Right. People are right. stealing. People are doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Um, dudes are going without soap, without deodorant, without mm. toothpaste so that they could get high. I've right. seen people sell their Thanksgiving trays, their Christmas trays, so that they could smoke K2 or Deuce, Tucci, whatever they want to call it. Um, was there cash? How did drug dealers take payment? Was there was it cash or was it mostly uh, trading for you know giving up your canteen or whatever? So it would work different, right? I mean, when you're doing big things like that, in federal prison, the currency is stamps. So a lot of times people want stamps, but I would take 100 books of stamps that are worthless on the street. They're dirty. They're beat up. I couldn't put them on a, on an envelope, right? But that's what the currency is. So let me say I got 100 books, $500 in stamps, $5 a book. I might tell you, have your family send me $450, 400 mm -hmm. or send it to my wife. A lot of times they did a lot of green dot. You remember when the green dot was out? Yeah. And then the federal prison system did something for about a year. I guess it was like a pilot program. They started allowing us from federal prison to Western Union money. So you might, I might be able to Western Union your girl $100. I'm just going to send 100 bucks. Boom. Tomorrow I'll send another 100 And you can go check your computer. Let me see your computer because we got email and shit like that. They'll look on my computer. Yep, that's there. Okay, now here, I'll give you your stamps. Or here, I'll Wait, give you you guys this. have email in there? There was email in there? What do you mean? Yeah, in federal prison, we got computers, right? And we have what's called the core link system. So we can email. I can email my family. It was a way for communication. Wow. They're just now getting tablets the last week or two. They're bringing in tablets now. Wow. But we had MP3 players. We could download music. You had to pay for it, obviously, like a dollar yeah. fifteen a song, a dollar thirty a song. Yeah. But we had them computers. I could email my wife, email my mom, email my grand, wow. email my lawyer, um, email your family. Yeah. Hey, so and so lost his email privileges. He just wants you to know. So we did have that email system. I assume they're reading your emails like they would mail, right? They say they're reading them, but I mean, can you of really course. read? Who, who the hell can read ten thousand emails at one prison in one right. day? You know what I mean? Right. 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 Are there? I mean, snitches? the federal are there bureau prison like cops. I, Sorry, are there cool. undercover cops in posing as inmates, or is it something more of where it's just uh, inmates will be working for them, working for the cops? Well, I'm I'm not going to say that there's undercover cops because I I never really knew if there was or not. But yeah, I mean, like I did in a video four days ago on on my channel, like Rafael Rafael Edmonds. He was out of Washington D.C. That's right. He was a dude that was setting up the cartel dudes while he was in prison. Right. You know, and, and making making big money. I mean, this guy was at one point selling, you know, 100 keys a month. So Just now he's in phone. prison. He hooks up with the Colombians yeah. and he's bubbling right from Lewisburg. Right. And, you know, I did that video and talk about what happened. And you know, it was like 20 different people ended up with life sentences out of it. But dude was bubbling right from prison. Did you see any of that? Were you did you or did you know of any, you know, cartel guys in the feds that were still working off the phone? Well, I mean, I was with the, you know, the Felix Ariano brothers, you know, the doctor. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was with the doctor. We were together in Raybrook. Um, and they're I out actually, of, just for the, actually, the listeners at home, those are the guys out of Tijuana. They were the head of the, the Tijuana cartel. So I was there, I was there with him, right? I was in uh, FCI Raybrook, ended up making it to a medium, which was also dangerous. They called it a mini, mini penitentiary. Um, I was over there with, with him. I was with a lot of, I mean, a lot of dudes that you'd be like, wow, I was with the mafia cops. Actually, uh, Steve Caracappa was my celly for like six or seven days. He was in USP Victorville. They ended up letting him go. They said, look, we're not going to do nothing to you, but you're not going to stay here. You can't stay here. Right. One of our homeboys from the East Coast had the car. Um, he, was a, he was an AB, but from Boston. And uh, he ended up letting him you know, leave the compound. And he came to the prison that I was at. We were cellies for like five or six days. And he ended up moving out, moving in with his own people. But you know, people can say he was a cop, but that dude was a stone cold killer. Mm -hmm. And he was a cop so that he could further the mafia's business. Right? right, right, right. Fascinating. So now you're, let's, I guess, moving, you know, towards, when did you start, uh, 
when did you start going down to the law library and start educating yourself? Like, tell me about that. So that kind of started in the county jail when I'm like, man, I got to learn how to do this stuff. I wasn't super serious about it. I thought, hey, I paid 40 grand for a lawyer. I'm going to be all right. But when I started feeling like the lawyer didn't give a shit after he got the money, not answering calls, I figured, hey, man, I better start working on this stuff, you know? So I spent a lot of time doing it in the county jail, but didn't really, I didn't really grasp it right away. And eventually I would go to federal prison, working on my case, working on my appeal. Even though I'm involved in that stuff, I would still go to the law library at night. Even though I'm involved in prison business, the cars business, mm -hmm. I would spend, you know, night times in the law library, seven, usually seven to nine at night. Back then, you didn't get recalled till about nine o'clock. So I would spend my time down there, started learning the law. And then eventually I end up in USP Coleman and we get locked down. And I'm kicking it with this kid from Tennessee. He's got a crack case. He's got a jailhouse lawyer helping him in another unit. He gets a reply while we're locked down. Sometimes they lock you down for 30 days, 60 days, 180 days. And he's for like, what? hey, man, I really Over need your like help. Bro. You're always in the law library. I can't respond to this. I don't know how. So I'm like, look, man, you know, I don't really, you know, trust myself to do other people's legal work. He's like, please, man, help me. I'll give you whatever you want. So I'm like, all right, bro, I'll give it a shot. So I do his stuff. I charge him $30 in soap and deodorant, right? Mm -hmm. 30 bucks. I write his stuff and win. We come off lockdown. He tells everybody I won. He's going home. And then what happens is this other guy comes to me. He's a Colombian guy that's doing a bunch of armed robberies down in Miami. You know, they're doing them carjackings and robbing people, right? They'll be plotting on you. You're a dope dealer. They're plotting on you. They pull you out of the car, take you to the house. They end up with 10 keys. I do his stuff. I do his 2255, his post-conviction motion, and I win it. Once I won that, man, it was off to the races. A guy named who I'm working on his case still to this day, Adaris Mazio Black, out of Detroit. He was a dude that was Angie Martinez's boyfriend. They found like 100 kilos on the tour bus that was going down to Arizona. He had a face transplant. Um, he went to Mexico to get a face transplant, but he ends up getting busted. He ends up with life. Nick Cannon was his best friend. Um, he was connected to some big people in California. But anyway, I ended up working on his case. We didn't win. And eventually, you know, I ended up getting out of prison. He ends up calling me about two years ago. So we're working on it now, getting ready to submit some stuff and Hopefully we win, but it's a very, very tough case. So you began, but that's how my legal career in federal prison started. Wow. Since then, I've probably got out over 100 men and women, bro, on both sides. Just, just, through clemency, just, just through post-conviction, through compassionate release. Right, right. So you're submitting, go into that. So, so it's not necessarily you're just finding loopholes to get their cases tossed. You're writing compassionate release letters. What is that exactly? So a compassionate release motion, this is what happens, right? This is how I end up getting out. I had 40 years. Donald Trump passes the first step back. He changes the law. He puts the discretion back in federal judges' hands, right? Before, federal judges were tied up. They couldn't right. do anything. They had to go by the chart. This is what I got to give you. Right. So now what the first step back says is if the judge finds that there's extraordinary and compelling reasons, he can reduce the sentence for whatever he wants to. If the sky is blue and he feels that it's extraordinary and compelling, he can do that. So I started writing them compassionate release motions. I wrote my own. I filed it. Eventually, John Gleason, who was the guy that prosecuted John Gotti, he becomes a federal judge for 22 years. He steps off the bench so he can help people, and he takes my case. Everybody thinks I'm going to be the first case to actually win for 924C stacking, which is five years for a gun, 25 for a second gun, on top of whatever you get for the drugs. That's how I ended up with the 40 years. And, you know, your listeners should, should check this out. I get 10 years for crack cocaine. I get five years for a 12-gauge shotgun and 25 years for a 22 rifle, all to run wild. So Trump changes that. He says, you don't get the second 25 years for a, a second gun. That was meant as a recidivist enhancement. You went to prison, didn't learn your lesson, got out, and did mm -hmm. it again. So now it's only five and five. So eventually the judge reduces my sentence to 20. He gives me five for the first gun, five for the second, and 10 for the for the Cocaine conspiracy. And did you use? And did, did you use uh, that? Uh, I guess uh, re retraction of the original law by Trump. And did you put that in your letter, in your compassionate release letter? Like here is why I should be let out. Is that like something you? One hundred percent. I had like a thirty-page motion, and right. that's what we argued. We argued this was an extraordinary and compelling reason. One, Congress changed the law under the First Step Act, right? Although they didn't make it retroactive, they said, "Hey, this law is wrong." But it's only going to apply to people that get arrested today, not all the people that are in prison suffering. Right. So we said, although they didn't make it retroactive, this is an extraordinary and compelling reason to reduce my sentence, Judge. Right. And on top of that, my rehabilitation. 
eventually I did change my life. I became a jailhouse lawyer. I got a college degree. Um, I did over a hundred rehabilitative programs in prison. So I kind of changed my life. When I got to an FCI, a medium security prison, I started to turn my life around. I taught leaders breed leaders. I mean, I did a lot of stuff. So now eventually I win that motion. I get out. I start a paralegal company. Parole officer tells me, you got to have, you know, you got to have a, uh, a job. Yeah. I said, man, I worked for these people for 15 cents an hour for the last 17 and a half years. I am the job. Yeah. I'm starting this company and he's kind of giving me a hard time, but eventually I put it together, right? Freedom Fighters Paralegal and Prison Consultant Firm. And since then, yeah, like I said, I've got numerous people out while in prison, but since I've been out, I helped my boy, Jimmy Romans. He had life for marijuana in the feds. I got Jimmy Romans out. I just did a case for a guy named Billy Brimer out of Boston, well-known bank robber, just got his sentence reduced. Um, but I knew the guy that started the G shine bloods in New York city, Chazzy Glenn, one of the, one of the originators, two murders in that case, he's got life. I make an argument on his case about him only being a young man, 21 years old. Right. His brain is different. It was like a 40 page motion. The judge right. reduces his life sentence to 30. So now he, he'll be out in about three or four years. Wow. And I imagine you're just going to be as, as marijuana starts to become basically legal everywhere, you're going to be, have your hands full because there's still probably a lot of dudes locked up doing decades or life sentences for pot specifically. I mean, 100%. I mean, I'm working on some of them cases now trying to get them dudes out through compassionate release. Right, right. And yeah, that's uh, what an insane 20 or 30 years of the drug war, man. Just watching people's lives flush down the toilet as children. Like when you're 21, you're like, I was, my parents were paying my cell phone. You know what I mean? Like they were, I was in college, I was a child, you know? But you know, a, a guy from Rochester, uh, uh, you know, he's sentenced like he is, like he's fucking El Chapo, you know? And there's thousands of people that were like that. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I don't know. And this is why you talk to a lot of inmates. They love Trump because Trump is specifically the one who started to roll back all of those draconian mandatory minimums. You know, if he would have did some bigger things on clemency, I think that, you know, he should have went big on clemency at the end. And yeah. I think that he would have pulled in some people, you know, yeah. a lot of formerly incarcerated people. Some people might not believe this, but a lot of formerly incarcerated people that are allowed to vote are voting Republican. Man. Sure, sure. Well, look, it was Biden. Uh, it was Biden in the 90s who really teamed up uh, with Hillary Clinton to pass the, you know, the super predator bill and those crime bills. It was Clinton was the one that really bloated it. it, it yes, Nixon began the war on drugs in the 70s, Republican Reagan under pressure, turn the heat up, but it really wasn't until the 90s and the democratic controlled government that uh, started giving out these huge, huge sentences for drugs. So a lot of people don't know that, but they're starting to know it now and they're starting to wake up to the bullshit. Did a lot more than that, man. When they did the 1994 crime bill, they did a lot of other stuff. They took away your right to habeas corpus, right? That the forefathers implemented in the constitution, bro. They took it away and said, you got one year so two years from now, you find that, hey, my constitutional rights were violated. You can't get back into court. They also took away, you know, funding, college funding for people. Um, if your mother lived in the housing projects and you had a felon, you couldn't go. You had a felony conviction. You couldn't go live there. So what happens when a dude gets out of prison? He's got nowhere to live. He's got no money. Can't go to his mother's house. What is he going to do? Right. He's back in the game. That's all exactly. he knows. He don't even yeah. have a place to live. Yeah. Can't go get a college education. Can't get a grant that he can, you know, a loan that he can pay back. He's not entitled to any of that shit. And that's some of what they did back then in 1994. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing how the cultures uh, swung the other way, you know? Um, now, what's your, what's your plan moving forward? What do you have going on these days? Besides, you know, obviously, your paralegal business is keeping you busy. Um, you're selling your book. Uh, are you able to travel or, you know, what's next? No, I mean, I do. I, we do some traveling. I actually went on a cruise, man, to Bermuda not too long ago. Amazing, but, uh, huh? My, my plans, bro, for real are I'd like to put a reentry house together in my city where I'm at, right? I mean, that's one of my plans. It costs money to do that type of stuff, but definitely want to stay on that track. I got the YouTube channel, you know, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. For real, it's a violent, you know, we talk about some violent stuff on there, but we always got a message because the mission, the mission statement is to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death through our stories and experiences. Yeah. Too many young kids are dying out on the streets, man. Too many young kids are getting involved in the drug game thinking they're going to blow up. And next thing you know, 
they made three or four thousand dollars and now they got a 40 year sentence in federal prison and can't read and read or write. Yeah. I had plenty of dudes from New York City, man, that couldn't read their own mail. And I don't mean to just focus on New York City, but, you know, there were dudes that couldn't even read and write. You're 30 years old. Yeah. All they knew was math. You know, I started right. teaching GED mm-hmm. classes in there and that's the way I taught kids in class. They knew the drug game. You take two quarters and put it together. What do you got? You got a half. Okay, yeah. so let's now convert that into money. Yeah. Let's say we got, you know, we got two hundred dollars plus two hundred dollars. What is it? And that's how I would teach people, man. I got a bunch of dudes their GED. You know, I help. Yeah. Them. Yeah. We were talking before the podcast about, uh, you know, when you grow up and you get some years under your belt, you really see that there's, in general, way more money to be made, especially nowadays, for a young man from the ghetto, even without an education like yourself, usually you make way more money in the legal space, doing something legal. I think the odds of ascending to uh, getting rich in the drug game are very low. I got very lucky. I was uh, you know, involved in a racket, pot, uh, shipping, shipping it all over the country. That was a very special time. I think the cocaine and, and the crack bubble of the 70s and 80s, that was a very brief special time. I think now, you know, young people don't realize you don't make that much money. When you count the time in prison you're going to do and getting jacked and maybe shot, you really don't make that much money selling drugs, you know? Uh, you, you've got to... 100%, yeah, go ahead. man. You know, you got to get to it. You have to get to, like, you have to get to the point where you're wholesaling it. And if you're from Rochester, if you're from Buffalo, if you're from Baltimore, if you're from, you know, you name it, uh, Rust Belt, USA you're probably not going to last long enough to get to that place. You know what I mean? 100%. I mean, you you might end up losing your life out there trying to get rich. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's inspiring, dude. Well, look, plug everything right now. Um, But, you know, I'm fascinated. I could talk to you for, you know, three days about all this shit, man. Um, But, yeah, go ahead and plug the book. Plug your your channel. uh, Tell everybody where they can find you, your Instagram, all of that. Okay, so uh, as far as the book goes... Blood on the razor wire takes you inside, you know, some of the most dangerous maximum security federal prisons in the country. You can get it on Amazon. I got my YouTube channel, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Um, Like I said earlier, the mission is to save kids from life imprisonment, premature death in the streets. We talk about some violent shit. I've interviewed former federal judges, like the judge that went to the White House to meet with Trump with Kim Kardashian. I interviewed him. I interviewed um, DEA agents that are actually agents now, former prison guards. I've in, interviewed former, you know, gang members, current gang members. I actually interviewed Troy Kell. Troy Gell, Kell was from the Gladiator days on HBO. He has not done an interview since HBO. It's been over 20 years. Um, that was a vicious, vicious, you know, video. That that's what opened the market to prison to the prison what genre back then. Now I'm not familiar with that. What is that? What is Gladiator? So Gladiator Days is a documentary about Troy Kell, who he ends up killing a black dude um, inside the unit. And, you know, there's some racial tension, whatever. He goes to prison out of Las Vegas for committing a murder. And in prison, he commits another murder. And they end up putting him on death row. That was kind of like what opened society's mind to prison. Right. Like, this was the video. And that was like in 2000, 2001. Right. And uh, things took off from there. People became interested in prison content. Oh, wow. So I interviewed him. He hasn't hasn't done an interview since HBO. He felt like HBO screwed him over. And painted their own narrative, but they showed the video in there. Is he on um, death row still? Currently on death row, yeah. Oh wow! So yeah, they don't he's execute actually a lot housed, of people. He's actually housed on death row in Utah. In, in for on on, a, on the federal level or on the state level? On the state level, he catches a murder when he's like 16, 17 right. in Nevada. Um, he's so wild in Nevada. They say we're transferring you. They contract him out to the state of Utah to serve yeah. his sentence. Um, while he's in Utah, he ends up killing that dude, yeah. Monty Blackman, inside the unit. Um, viciously, viciously stabs him. Oof. You should check out Gladiator Days. Yeah, I will. So, you know, we do stuff like that. I got some content on my channel where, you know, there's a guy that brutally murders another dude in USP Polak, one of the most dangerous federal prisons in the country. I actually played the, the video footage in that video. Wow. So, you know, we're doing big things over there. Um, the Instagram is chadmarks102. You can check me out on there. I should change it to Blood on the Razor Wire. But, you know, stop by. Check out the channel. You might like it. You can check out the book on Amazon. It sold out on the first day, so I promise you won't be uh, disappointed. I do have the audio book. I've been independently selling it, which I should put it up. But I narrate my own book as well, and I think people will be interested. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to read it. 
That's amazing. And, uh, you know, congrats on your, your freedom, man. It's like, it's, it's making me tear up. Uh, you really see the human potential uh, in stories like yours. You know what I mean? Uh, and I just think uh, the whole system, man, it's a trap, you know? And hopefully in a century, we'll look back on this as, you know, like a, a, a brief dark time, you know? 100%. And, you know, let me tell you this so you know. It was devastating for me, you know, and I don't glorify or glamorize my life or the things that I've done. I've done some bad things to people, but I've changed my life. I turned my life around. And in fact, the other day I ended up interviewing. You're going to probably be like, what? I ended up interviewing the dude that started my case, man. The kid that I looked up to. He wore a white around me. I mean, there were years I, for years I wanted to just yeah. do some bad things to this dude. This was the guy and that just got the other, you locked up in the feds or the original state case? The guy that got me locked up in the feds. So uh, I see him. I see him one day when I first get out. Tell him, bro, you're a piece of shit. And pretty much just ridicule this dude. Yeah. And then I see him the other day waving people down to try to get a jump. He's 120 pounds, drug addict. And I get out of the car. He's like, oh, man, I don't. I said, I don't want no problems, man. I just want to talk to you. I ain't going to do nothing to you. He's like, please don't hurt me. I said, bro, you said that on the wire that right. you wore on me. Don't say that to me. I'm not yeah. here to hurt you. And we talk. And he's like, I've been watching your YouTube channel. He's like, I'd like to do an interview and apologize for what I've done, man. And I'm like, man, listen, if that's what you want to do, we'll do it. I sat down and I did that interview with him. So I think it's pretty interesting, man, for people to check that out. That's fascinating. Yes, you must, you must, must, must check out Chad's YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, you ever come to L.A. or I'm in Rochester, man, we got to get up, you know? 100%, man. I'd like to meet you in person. And again, man, I appreciate you bringing me on. I got 85,000 subscribers. Your YouTube channel's taking off. You know, you're a very interesting dude. You tell some, you know, pretty good stories. And, you know, you've been through some experiences yourself. So I definitely appreciate you bringing me on, man. You got it, Chad. We'll talk soon. Okay, buddy? Yep, I appreciate congrats you. Thank you, bro. Congrats on all the success. And uh, congrats on your freedom, man. Thank you. And congrats to you for all the things you're doing. You got it, buddy. Take care. You too. All right.